Um, sorry, guys, I forgot to start recording, so I'm a little bit behind, but this is what we've done. Okay? It's pretty easy. Solute, solvent, solution. All right. So, what we want to look at is we want to look at how exactly does something dissolve in water first, what's the actual overall process, and then two, we're going to look at what type of particles do they dissolve into, electrolytes and non-electrolytes, ions versus molecules, and how do we know which one's going to be which, and then that's going to lead us into writing and balancing our, our total and net ionic equations, because does it dissolve as a molecule or does it dissolve as an ion, do we break it apart, do we keep it together, and how do we know which one is which, okay, so that's the ultimate plan for today. So we have these definitions. So when we look then at the solution process, there's three steps to the solution process. Okay? Step one is solute, solute. Okay? What do you think that means? What has to happen for salt to dissolve in water? There are three things that have to happen for salt to dissolve in water. So solute, solute. Say what, Anthony? The solute has to break apart. We have to break these pieces apart from one another because they're not going to dissolve as one big chunk. It's, why does it disappear? Breaks up into the individual parts that are making it up. Okay. So we have to get them apart from one another because they, they, they do stick to one another. They have attractions. In an ionic compound, what's the attraction called? Ionic bond. Okay? An ionic bond. Okay? In a covalent compound like, like sugar and things, that's when we have those IMFs, those intermolecular forces that are holding the molecules together because when sugar dissolves, Carbon doesn't break from hydrogen, break from oxygen. It's sugar molecule breaking from sugar molecule, break from sugar molecule. So it's the IMFs. And does anybody remember what, what our IMFs are? No, no, that, that, those are your fundamental forces. Okay, y'all. Intermolecular forces. What are the three? It's a kind of hush all over the world. Hydrogen bonds, I heard one. That's the strongest of the three. One's is named after a city in England. London forces, London dispersion forces. That's hydrogen bonds, okay. And then the third one. This one, this one is kind of a repetitive one. Dipole, dipole. Oh. The attraction between polar molecules. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I remember, <laughs> I remember memorizing it one time and then forgetting it. But <laughs> okay. So to, to say I learned it. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, listen. So we have to overcome. You have to overcome the attractions. between solute particles. And I'm saying particles because it, oh, it looks like a D. Because it could be ions, it could be molecules, okay? It could, you know, there's a variety of different things, so just particles in general. The attractions between solute particles must be overcome. Now, do you think that requires energy? or releases energy to do that? Requires energy, okay? Requires energy, and so is that going to be endothermic or exothermic? That's endothermic. Okay? Endothermic, because breaking up is always hard to do. Okay? <laughs> You always stress about having to make that phone call, and nowadays you guys just do it over text. Okay? Okay? Sorry. Hey, it's not you. It's me. Can we just be friends? You know, text, you know. 
You used to have to fa do it face to face. Okay? Y'all. Morgan, Morgan, Morgan. Okay? So, it always takes energy to break bonds. This is a very, listen, ladies. This is a very, 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 super, very important concept. We're going to use it all year long. Breaking bonds always requires energy. Forming bonds always releases energy, okay? So at any time we're breaking a bond, the attractions must be overcome. It's going to require energy to break attractions apart. It takes energy to break. The, they're held together by magnets. I have to put energy in to break this chlorine off of here, to break the bond, okay? Now, so what, the next one is Sullivan's solvent, okay? Now, we kind of, well, it's just kind of when you talk about this, we talk again, ionic compounds, you have to overcome the ionic bonds, covalent compounds, you overcome the IMFs. So if you want to kind of add that in to the side somewhere, ionic compounds, It's ionic bonds, whereas covalent compounds, you overcome IMFs. That's the forces that have to be overcome. And again, how do we tell an ionic compound? A metal and a nonmetal. And a covalent is going to be? Two nonmetals. Okay? Solvent, solvent. What do you think that means then? The solvent has to not necessarily break up as like we think of as much of the solute, but it's got to move apart to make room for the solute to come in between. So the water molecules have to spread apart from one another to let the Na plus and the Cl minus in between, to let the sugar molecules in between. So the solvent molecules must spread apart to make room for solute particles. Okay? So we have to make room. Now, again, is that going to require energy or release energy to move the water molecules apart from one another? Require. require, because the water molecules are held together by those IMFs, the London forces, dipole-dipole, and the much stronger hydrogen bonds. So you have to put energy in again to move those apart. So again, requires energy. So it's endothermic. And then lastly, what do you think the last one is? Solute solvent. Okay? There must be, there must be an attraction between the solute and the solvent. In order for the two to, in order for the two to dissolve. Okay, you have to have an attraction. Now this is where we, you guys may have learned like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, right? But we have to be able to explain that now in a deeper, more um, chemistry explanation than just like dissolves like. So, when the solute, this is underneath three, this is a bullet underneath three. The solute 
must, no, oh, pardon me, the solvent. must attach to the solute and pull it into solution. Okay? General term is called solvation. If the solvent is if the solvent is water, it's called hydration. Okay? So it has to hydrate, it has to surround, it has to pull the solute into solution. Okay? So the solvent, that has to be, there has to be an attraction. If there is not a strong enough attraction between the solute and the solvent to overcome these two, it's really this number three that caused one and two to happen. It's the attraction between the solute and the solvent that causes the solute to break apart, that causes the solvent to move apart and allow them to mix together. So three is really causing one and two. So if there is no three, nothing happens to one and two. This is the deal with, with uh, oil and water. Okay? Oil is nonpolar. Okay? It's just even, the electrons are evenly distributed. There's no positive or negative side to it at all. It is a nonpolar solvent. Okay? So, water has these strong hydrogen bonds holding it together. So, water is pretty strongly held together. It, you know, it's got a relatively high boiling point for a small covalent molecular substance like it is. Okay, so when you go and you put in something like uh, oil into it, there's no attraction between the polar water and the nonpolar oil. So there's nothing to make the water want to separate, to break apart. It's much, much more attracted to itself than it is to the oil. So the solute solvent is not strong enough, the attraction is not strong enough to overcome the much stronger solvent to solvent hydrogen bonds in water. So they don't mix. They just sit, and one sits on top of the other. The less dense is on top. The oil's less dense, so it's sitting on top. The water's on the bottom. So they don't mix. On the other hand, salt has this very strong Na plus and Cl minus. Well, water being polar, it has these positive and negative ends to it. And so it'll come and attract and pull and then surround, hydrate as it attracts, as I'm Whenever you mess with water, you always spill some. <laughs> so it's going to hydrate. And notice that the Cl minus, okay, the H is attached to it. Because when water is polar, we say water has, okay, positive, positive, and negative. It's got that positive ends and negative ends. So the oxygen is the negative end. Now, does anybody know what that letter is? It's Greek. Calculus. Calculus and probably looks more like that. Yeah, cursive S. Now it's it's a delta. It's a capital or is the triangle capital? And then it's a lowercase delta. Just like that. Okay? So, that just means partial positive, partial negative charge. It's a covalent compound. If it was a complete ionic transfer of electrons, we'd just write plus and minus, like Na plus and Cl minus. Okay? But in a polar molecule, we just say it's partially charged. It's got an uneven sharing. It's not, it's not a full charge. So we use the delta meaning partial charge, partial positive, partial negative. Okay? So that's just the symbol. But the oxygen is the negative end and the chlorine and the hydrogen is the positive end. So notice that the Cl minus, the hydrogens are all going to attach to it. When we end up getting an Na plus, then the other part is going to attach to it. 
and it hydrates it. Now, this is going to be important because you're going to have to draw this. Okay? Again. How do you spell partial? P-A-R-T-I-A-L. Okay? So now notice that the two particles are hydrated. So in water, when you're floating around, you put... Come on, y'all. I know, but, I mean, you spelled it four times. So when it's surrounded, okay, this is what's happening. So the big piece of salt that you're shaking onto your green beans at home, but not in the cafeteria because it's bad for you, okay? Don't get me started. Okay? You see it when it's all clumped together. It's big enough to see. But when you put it into water, one at a time, the water hydrates, goes through the process of hydration. It, it pulls out, off each positive and negative. But the oxygen, which is the negative, is going to surround the positive ion, the Na+. The hydrogens, which are positive, are going to attach to the negative ion and surround it. So now the two ions can't attach. The water still kind of is attached to one another, but the ions aren't attached to each other. And so they're, they're separated. They're in the solution, and they have no mobility to break, break apart. But then you evaporate the water off, and once all the water goes away, then the ions can come back together as you evaporate the water. Okay? So, the dissolving process. This number three. So, obviously, this is, is this bonds forming or bonds breaking here? Forming. So, what happens to energy? Energy is released. So, that is called exothermic. So your overall heat of solution, the overall energy change that happens when something dissolves is dependent upon the values of these. You have a positive, you have a positive, and you have a negative. And by the way, exothermic is negative. That doesn't mean that it's um, got so little energy it's negative. Positive and negative just simply means which direction is the energy flowing. Positive means it's going into the system. Negative means it's going out of the system. Okay? Now, let me try to explain this because energy is, you know, what happens, what happens, how do you tell if something is endothermic? It gets cold. If energy is going into it, if it's absorbing energy, how can it be getting cold? Okay? Okay, so, but th that's the opposite, so if like a black shirt absorbs energy, you get hot, but we're saying in a reaction it's absorbing energy, it's getting cold, okay, there's a big difference in energy, there's two types of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, kinetic energy is the motion of the molecules, the faster things are, heat them up, speed them up, okay, the faster the molecules going, the higher the temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Okay? How fast the molecules are moving. Now, I'm really going to do this when we get into thermochemistry, which is going to be right before Christmas, but just to kind of give you an idea on some of these energy changes, how this can, be, can go, and then let your brain think on it for a while. Okay? So, no, it's not necessarily going to be on this test, but we need to be able to start wrapping our brain around it. So, kinetic energy is molecules moving faster. But any time we're talking about bonds forming and bonds breaking, we're talking about a potential energy. If I raise this book up right now, I just increase this gravitational potential energy, right? Is this book any hotter than it was before? But it's got more energy, right? So sometimes you can put energy into something, and it's not changing how fast or slow the molecules are going. You're changing its position relative to something else, and so you're changing its stored or its potential energy. So potential energy is, in physics, it's referred to as the latent heat. The word latent, good ACT word, latent means hidden or invisible. Sometimes they might say, ooh, that person has so much latent potential. You just have so much ability that just hasn't been seen yet. You haven't just been able to, to live up to those expectations yet. You, know, you just have that latent potential. 
It's there, but it's just hidden. It hasn't come out yet. So latent heat is potential energy. A thermometer doesn't measure changes in potential energy. Okay? Uh, uh, we can measure the changes in potential energy, but we can't actually even measure the amount of potential energy in a substance. So, really, potential energy in chemistry is energy of position. So if you change positions, the molecules' positions relative to one another, you rearrange them. You do a chemical reaction. Atoms rearrange. You break bonds, you form bonds. That's a change in potential energy. Thermometer doesn't measure that. It's a difference in energy, but it's not measured by the thermometer. So, in a chemical reaction, you're dissolving this and breaking bonds and forming bonds. This is all changes in potential energy. Energy of positions as the molecules are breaking apart from one another and as they're recombining with one another. So you're changing not how fast or slow they're going, you're changing their position and the bonds that are being formed and broken. So what happens is when you put the salt into the water, there's a whole bunch of water that's just part of the surroundings. Okay? There's a lot more water than, actually that's than is actually attaching to the molecules. So that's the surroundings. The beaker is the surroundings. So those molecules are moving fast, so that energy, the kinetic energy, is being converted into potential energy as the, as the, to break a bond so it gets absorbed. So if it's an endothermic reaction, that means it's requiring energy. It's getting the energy from the kinetic energy of everything surrounding it. So the kinetic energy of the surroundings goes down. That's what the temperature is measuring, so it gets cold. But the potential energy of the system, the things that are actually reacting, has actually gone up. So kinetic energy has changed into potential energy. Just like here, I'm doing kinetic energy, changing it into potential energy. I just did work. I just put energy into the book. I had to exert energy to do that. Well, I have less energy now. My arm's getting tired. Okay? But the book has more potential energy. Now, if I want to change that energy that I put in into different energy, I drop it. Okay? <laughs> you saw it coming. <laughs> okay? So it changes it back to kinetic energy, and then it hits the ground and changes it into sound and vibration and other energies, but now it has much less potential energy when it's on the ground. So the potential energy was changed back into kinetic energy of the motion of the molecules. So you can go back and forth between the two. But a thermometer only measures changes in kinetic energy. So we have to have a, uh, our wrap our brain around... You always have the system and the surroundings. The system is the thing that actually reacts. That's your, your reactants and products. That's the actual chemicals. The surroundings is the water it's taking place in, the beaker, if you happen to have it in your hand, whatever it's touching, the, the air around you. Like when I burn a piece of paper, okay? When I burn a piece of paper, the potential energy of the products is way less than the potential energy of the paper. Okay, So the paper, the atoms and molecules are all arranged in a certain way. And then we put a little energy to it and we break them apart and rearrange them into carbon dioxide and water and the ashes. Well, there's much less potential energy in the ashes than there were in the paper to start with. Well, where did that energy go? It went to the surroundings and the surroundings absorbed it as kinetic energy and got moving real fast and got hot. The temperature went way up, fire. Okay? So that, that kinetic energy, the fire, the heat that we feel, is all stored as potential energy. When the bonds break and new bonds form, there's more energy released than was required. And that re energy that's released goes to the surroundings, which is the air, which is hopefully not your hand or whatever, you know, is where the fire is. Is that making sense? Okay? So bonds breaking, bonds forming is always potential energy. Thermometer doesn't measure that. So the surroundings is what's getting cold because the kinetic energy of the surrounding is being absorbed by the reaction to break bonds. So the, the system has more energy, but the surroundings has less energy. And we're always measuring the temperature of the surroundings. So kinetic energy of the surroundings being converted into potential energy of the system in an endothermic reaction, so the surroundings get cold. In an exothermic reaction, energy is released from the system 
to the surroundings, so the system has less energy, but the surroundings then absorb that energy as kinetic, and so they get hot, so the temperature goes up. So it's the law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's just changing from potential to kinetic, from system to the surroundings. So the system, let's go to the black shirt analogy now, okay? The system is absorbing energy, but it's potential, so the thermometer doesn't measure it. Surroundings get cold. When the system releases energy to the surroundings, the system goes down, surroundings goes up. So it, it's, it's the yin and the yang. It's the up and the down. It's the, the conservation of energy. One gains, the other loses. System, surroundings. The reaction is always the system. The beaker, the water, the everything else is the surroundings. Potential energy is bonds breaking, bonds forming. Kinetic energy is how fast they're moving. Temperature thermometer only measures kinetic energy. Okay? Woo! That's a big concept. My brain hurts just trying to think about it. Okay? So, whether or not the overall dissolving process is endothermic or exothermic depends upon the quantities. If these two are greater than this one, if the two positives are greater than the negative, then the overall heat is going to be positive, meaning energy has to go in, it's endothermic. If number three is greater than one plus two, then the overall delta H of solution is going to be negative. So your delta H, and H stands for heat, delta H of the solution is equal to delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. Okay? Now, for ionic compounds, for ionic compounds, this is referred to as the lattice energy. One and one plus two is really one. It's really one, but they kind of throw two into it with it. Remember, we said that. Ionic compounds don't form molecules. Instead, they form these crystal lattice structures, that repeating pattern over and over again. So the lattice energy is the energy needed to break them apart, break the ions apart. It's really to break the ionic bonds. That's called the lattice energy. Okay? So the, if you want to write that lattice is, uh, oh, it's right there. So the lattice energy, energy needed to break ionic compounds apart. That's the definition of lattice energy. Energy needed to break ionic compounds apart. It's coming. Come on. Keep up. Over here, boy. <laughs> this is called the energy. Since water is the most common solvent, we call it the energy of hydration. It could just be called energy of solvation. Okay, if it wasn't water, if it was trying to dissolve something in alcohol or something else, we'd just use solvation as the process. Okay? So we're really looking at our heat of solution. If something is really positive, that means it's got a, a high lattice energy if you have a positive heat of solution. If we have a negative heat of solution, that means there's a high energy of, of hydration. When I was making the sulfuric acid for you guys on that last lap, I had to dilute it from concentrated, 18 molar, that's why I buy it in the bottle, and I had to dilute it down to 6 molar, so I had to add a bunch of water. And what's the rule for adding acid and water together? Which one do you add to which? Add the acid, do what you ought to, add the acid to the water. Okay? Do what you ought to, add the acid to the water. Got to make a run. Okay, got to act like a New Englander when you say it. Okay, because there is extreme energy of hydration. When you put in acid into water, that H plus comes off. There's an extreme attraction between the H plus from the acid and the water. It releases a tremendous amount of energy right here. This amount is way greater than breaking the hydrogen bonds 
or the, the breaking the hydrogen off because that hydrogen is really held weakly on an acid. Okay? So this energy is much, much lower, so a very high energy of hydration. So that energy of hydration, that when that water sticks to that H+, a lot of energy is released. It's released to the rest of the water, and if you add a bunch of acid to a little bit of water, the water can absorb so much heat that it begins to boil and can actually flash off as steam and come flying out of the what beaker or whatever you're mixing in with hot, boiling acid water, and that's not good. So you add the acid to the water so the water can dissipate the heat more thoroughly and not boil and not make a mess. Okay? Because when you add acids to water, they have extremely high energy of hydration. On the other hand, have you all ever seen the instant ice pack? The kind of like in a first aid kit where you just kind of make the two things run together and it gets super cold? That is going to be one. It's just a dissolving thing. It's not a chemical reaction. It's just dissolving. But here the lattice energy is very high. And so as a result, it takes a lot of energy to get it dissolved. That energy comes from all the surrounding water, so the water all gets super cold, and you get a, 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 an ice pack, so to speak, just by mixing the two things together. Have you all seen the, the, the hot hand things where you just kind of have a little penny thing in, on the inside, and you kind of just snap it, and, you know, and then all of a sudden it gets hot? That's going to be something that has a high energy of hydration. Okay? As a matter of fact, it, uh, today's Wednesday, and we don't have a break. We're about to take a break. Okay? I'm going to go set you up something here. What do we got? Oh, I don't even have a ring stand. Okay. Can I, can I make this one work? Nope. I can't make that one. I think you guys need a mental break anyway. Take a break. <laughs> Camera, you got to stay. Sodium acetate. Oh, so I need two. Th I know. I need two things. He's what finishing up his test. No. Oh. He said he just wants the wait. Okay. So I'm just going to heat that up. That's going to just take a second. I need two more things. Sorry. Two more things. Thank <laughs> you. 
to the water. The water's attractive force between itself with the hydrogen bonds are much stronger than the weaker London forces, and so there's nothing to pull them apart. Now, acetone only has weak London forces holding the molecules together. Styrofoam only has weak London forces holding itself together. Acetone and styrofoam will have the same weak London forces attracting to each other. So they're, they're equally attracted to each other as they are themselves. And so as a result, this solute solvent is strong enough to overcome the two, and it dissolves. Okay? When you put salt into water, the salt, it, the attraction between the, the salt and the water is great enough to overcome the lattice energy holding the Na plus and Cl minus together. Because three, four, five waters attack a single ion and pull it into solution and then surround it. They hydrate it. Okay? So, like dissolves like. Now, this could take a little bit before. Um, What's that? What is it? Yeah. It's sodium acetate. Okay? <laughs> sodium acetate trihydrate. Three waters. Now, listen. Y'all come back to me. Back row, come back to me. 
So what I'm doing here is I'm heating this up. I'm trying to get the water to be boiling hot. And I'm actually not going to melt the sodium acetate. I'm going to dissolve it in the water of hydration that's trapped inside the crystal. It's a trihydrate. So it's so soluble at high temperatures that when we walk, knock the water out of the crystal, the crystal will actually dissolve in that water. So I don't have to add any water back to it. But it's a temperature dependent thing, so I've got to heat it up enough to, to make that happen. Then I'm going to cool it down and we make what's called a supersaturated solution, but we'll get there. Graver, I think, did this one with you. Yeah. Okay? And it's very cool. Actually, it gets warm, but um, which is what I want to show you. So, our solution process, these three things. So we have to work all year long. This is one of the main things that AP Chemistry is pushing. This is a big topic in AP Chemistry. One, I would say one of the biggest five concepts that they're going to ask about is this solution process. Okay? So it's very important that we kind of just keep that. So I'm starting early with this, and we'll be referring to it all the time. And we have to talk about the attractive forces between them. Okay? And, and when we get into bonding, we'll talk more about the IMFs and the strengths of the IMFs and how they interact. But it's all going to be these attractions. So this is the solution process. This is what has to happen. Now, when, and I'll come back to this, but when something dissolves, it can dissolve in one of two forms either as an ion or as a molecule. and all that. Okay. I told you that this was that's all that yesterday. This, no, but this was this was caused by the guy that made the first thirty six here at Spain Park. Now that all YouTube is that Yeah, hey YouTube, Connor Cock, right here. This whole my board. Okay? And his friend Paul Hoseman. Okay? Paul. Paul's one who ducked. I know still, I still blame him. So when a solute dissolves. It can dissolve. Either as ions or neutral molecules. Okay, ladies. Oh, for two. Yeah. All right, so electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Gatorade. Okay, these are substances that dissolve as ions, consequently, what was true about their, their, okay, so what? They don't have an electric charge, they will, uh, what is the definition of electrolyte? What is, I mean, it dissolves as ions, but what is that, a, it'll carry or conduct an electric charge. It doesn't produce the electric charge, but it'll allow electricity to flow through it. Okay? Contrary to popular belief, pure water does not conduct electricity. I'm about to go take another break here and go get some more stuff. Okay? Electrolytes. Substances whose water solutions will conduct electricity because the solute dissolves as what? 
because the solute dissolves as ions. Solute dissolves as ions. Okay, now there are three substances that dissolve as ions. Three types of substances, okay? So three types of electrolytes. So one, or we'll, we'll just start with salts. No, we're not. We're going to start with strong bases. Okay? Strong bases. When are you going to deal with the things that are slowly turning clear? Uh, when it's all clear. Okay. Okay? Wait, so these three are... These are, the, these are under electrolytes. These are the three types of electrolytes. Electrolytes are either acids, bases, or salts. But it really has to be a strong acid, strong base. Uh, um, now, a weak acid will be a weak electrolyte. A strong acid can be a strong electrolyte. So strong bases. What is a base? It's all about it. that's 7 to 14. What ion is present in all bases? OH minus, hydroxide ion. Okay? So it's a metal... Plus OH minus. Okay? Your seven strong bases. Okay? What's the name of the family that means base? Uh, alkali. Alkali, remember, means basic. Okay? Our seven strong bases are, let's start that way, Li. LiOH. NaOH. Okay? K O H R B O H okay C S O H and then barium hydroxide and strontium hydroxide those are your seven strong bases L I O H what I mean it's got the dot right above it yeah, but so I think it's eyeballs. Like we have a colon in the middle of a formula. I didn't, that's exactly what I thought. Is that R? Is that C? Oh, shoot. Yeah, that, now that one is my fault. Okay. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have to scratch it out now. Sorry. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I am not perfect. Oh. <laughs> I try to believe it. I try to convince my wife of it. All right. So, those seven strong bases. Now, oh, there we go. Uh So, what does that mean, strong bases? Why are those strong electrolytes? Why are those strong electrolytes? Okay? Because what? They split up. What's the word for ionic compounds? First off, is this ionic? Is this, is this ionic or is this covalent? Because the first thing's a metal, right? Right. Okay. Mallard, stay focused on me, please. Don't give me that. You're sitting there talking with Madison right there the whole time. Don't give me that. Seriously, you guys need to focus. Okay? Now, these are ionic compounds, but it's a special type of ionic compound where the negative ion is always hydroxide. So when you put it into water, NH2O, okay, your LiOH solid, <coughs> NH2O, is going to break up into Li plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous. It's going to dissociate into ions. Every single one of these is going to do the same thing. Now, barium hydroxide, what's it going to break up into? BA2 plus. BA2 plus aqueous plus 2 OH minuses. This is considered to be dibasic. It's going to produce 2 OH minuses. Every one barium hydroxide produces 2 OHs. But the key is, is that dissolving, it is dissolving as ions. Okay? Dissolving as ions. Now, a weak base, weak bases dissolve 
mainly as molecules, but do produce a few ions. Okay, so a weak base is something like ammonia, NH3, that you actually put into water. Okay, that's going to make Na4 plus plus OH minus. It actually breaks the water apart, hydrolyzes the water, breaks it apart. Okay, now the reality is is that it's only about one percent that actually reacts. So most of the ammonia, when you like, even have Mr. Clean ammonia cleaner. Most of it is actually ammonia gas dissolved in the water. That's why you can smell the ammonia coming off, because it's mainly in the gaseous form. Very little of it is actually breaking up into ions. We do still have some ions, so it's considered a weak electrolyte, but just not very many. Okay? Yes, sir? Is that another type that forms? We're still under, we're still under strong basis. This is all under number one. Okay? We're all still talking about electrolytes, but we're going to have a... a a strong electrolyte versus weak electrolyte. It, based on how many ions. Obviously, the more ions you have, the better it conducts electricity. So if you have a bunch of ions, strong bases, they 100%. This is, so we can say 100% here versus 1%. Completely ionized, barely ionized. Okay? A lot of ions, few ions. Strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte. Okay? Now... Okay, get this nice and cold. Okay, now take a break once again. I'll be right back. Oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> Follow me and Anthony's spam and eyes. Thanks, Kia. Hi. <laughs> Do you want? 
Okay. Now, let's do one thing at a time here. So, this that we've been working on. Okay? This is now what we call a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. Okay? Now, what does it mean to be saturated? Not super saturated, it's too much. Saturated means it's, it's taking the max amount you can put in, okay? So if something is saturated, you put a little bit more in, most of the time it just goes to the bottom. And the rest won't dissolve. That's what happens like you put the sugar in the iced tea and you stir and stir, but some of the sugar just stays at the bottom. Okay? So you want to make ice the sweet tea really with hot tea, because then you get more to dissolve uh, and then cool it down. Okay? If it's unsaturated, that means you have less than the maximum amount. Okay? Every once in a while, you can get a crazy compound that does what's called supersaturated. You actually have more in here than the maximum amount. Okay? Now, it doesn't like being this. This is an unstable situation. Okay? Some of y'all's green crystals went supersaturated. As you were cooling it down in the ice bath, it wouldn't precipitate out until I went in and stirred it just a little bit. If I kind of gave this a good shake, I could kind of make the extra amount come out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one more crystal of sodium acetate. See, what? Star Wars is coming back out there. They have a new movie coming out, don't they, real soon? The, okay. In the original Star Wars, the very first one, back in the 70s, I think it was, okay, Luke, Princess Leia, and Han Solo get trapped in a trash compactor, okay, with some animal down in the bottom, and the walls are caving in on them, okay, and they're trying to figure out how to escape. That's what happens with this when we take it from the hot water to the cold water. It's like the walls begin caving in on the solute, making less and less room for them, even though physically the room's not the same, but the solubility is decreasing, okay? Solubility is decreasing, so as a result, there, the solubility should be going down. There should be some solid coming out, but there's peer pressure amongst the ions. Nobody wants to be the first one to leave. Nobody wants to be the first one to precipitate out. I kind of think of it like prom, okay? At prom, and in Baton Rouge especially, they had prom at a hotel, and the kids would rent rooms at the hotel for an after party because they told the parents, we need some place to go where we can change, okay? <laughs> Parents, I don't know if they just were naive, they bought it, or you know, they just turned a blind eye, whatever. But yes, that's where the after party was. And so they had, they had like a hotel rooms designed for four people. Well, they would get adjoining rooms and theoretically have the smoking and non-smoking room, but you know, it never really kind of works that way. They had the bathtub full of ice and, and drinks of like Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew. Okay. You know, but, but you come straight, you come straight from the dance, so you're all sweaty and whatever, and you crowd into this room. You got 30 and 40 people in this small hotel room. It's all crammed. It's hot and sweaty. Uh, you know, you got the guy that got into the Dr. Peppers too soon, and he's in the bathroom throwing up, you know, calling out for Ralph, you know, just too much sugar, I guess, in his system. Um, and so, you know, you have the couple in the corner that's just making out, and you say, hey, get a room, and then you stop and realize, oh, wait, they did. And so, you know, and, but you're there, but you're totally uncomfortable, but hey, this is prom. This is, this is the fun. This is, this is what I've been waiting all my life for to, to do is go to prom. But you don't want to be the first one to leave. Okay, But then all it takes is one person to be a leader. One person to say, hey, I didn't really want to be here anyway. I'm not having fun. Are you having fun? I'm not having fun. So when you look, I'm just taking, it's actually kind of a group of people here, just a small little crystal. Okay, So I take this crystal, and I put it in there, and it says, hey, if you're leaving, I'm leaving. Well, if you're leaving, I'm leaving. Well, I didn't want to be here anyway. I just thought that you wanted to stay. Oh, no, I wasn't having fun at all. And so eventually, one person can make a really big difference and be a leader in the situation. Okay? Now, okay? I took it out of an ice water bath, right? Feel it. Feel it. It's warm. Okay. <laughs> 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 Alright, we need some guys. 
Just pass it around. Just pass it around. Okay. All right. So. So. In terms of, let we got to backtrack for a second now. In terms of bonds breaking and bonds forming, we had to add energy in. Do y'all listen? Put the phones away. Put the, all the electronics away. I mean, there's not just you. There's several around here all looking at your phones. Okay? Now, in terms of energy, I had to put energy in to break the bonds to be able to get the sodium acetate to dissolve. Okay? I had to put it in boiling water. I had to take energy from the surroundings, all this boiling water, and put it into the system, into the sodium acetate, to break the, to break the bonds between the sodium and the acetate and the water molecules, break them all apart so they could dissolve in the water. It was an extremely endothermic reaction, so one and two were way greater than three. Okay? But then, when I took it out, and then the bonds began to reform, the same amount of energy that I put in to make it dissolve is now released to the surroundings, the beaker, your hand when you feel it, when the bonds reform. So it's kinetic energy, the water's super hot, so the kinetic energy of the molecules here got absorbed by the system, the sodium acetate, and the water molecules to break the bonds that have changed the kinetic into potential energy. So in the dissolved form, it has a much higher potential energy than it does kinetic energy. So then I cooled it down and lowered the solubility to make it to where they want to reform bonds again. Added one little seed crystal, that's what it's called, a seed crystal to it. And that caused all the bond formation to occur. So when the bonds formed, all that stored potential energy that we put into it was then released back to the surroundings. And the surroundings, your hand, the test tube, the now solid that is after the products of a reactant become the surroundings, all get warm. Okay? So that's an energy change that's taking place. That's why I wanted to do that, just kind of show energy in, energy out. Now, so that's a super saturated solution. Now, not every substance. You can't just add more sugar into water and make it super saturated. Only a few things will make a super saturated solution. They're rare. And the way you make them is you, you get them saturated at a high temperature, then you cool them down slowly, and then it's super saturated. And then you can either do one of three things. You can either shake it or stir it, which is what a can of pop is, a super saturated CO2 in water. So when you shake it up and then open it, you're making all that extra CO2 come flying out, and it brings a lot of the liquid with you and makes a big mess. You can scratch or stir the bottom, which is what I did with your green crystals, for those of you that didn't precipitate it first. Or you can add a seed crystal, which is one more little sodium acetate, and be a leader. Okay? One person can make a difference. So, now, in terms of electrolytes, strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes, Show. A cooking show. Shit. Yeah. Cooking with chemistry. <laughs> Ooh, got all this water right by the socket. That's good. Okay. Okay, so what makes water conduct electricity? So here's some distilled water. Now, what I have here is a very unsafe apparatus. Okay? Because I have two electrodes. It, okay? I have it now plugged in. But why is the light bulb not on? Because it's an open circuit, right? You have to have a closed, double check, closed circuit in order to make it conduct. Okay? We don't want that touching it. Okay? So now when I plug it in, so now when I plug it in, the, the scupula, Gentlemen, the scupula is completing the circuit so the light comes on. So we need something that's going to conduct electricity. We'll learn later on in bonding why metals conduct electricity. So if I take pure water, pure distilled water, great value distilled water, okay, great value distilled water, and I put it here 
it doesn't conduct electricity. Pure water does not, because pure water is composed of neutral H2O molecules. Okay? You have to have ions in solution, electrolytes. Now, did you see how that did that? Yeah. Have you ever noticed how when you uh, like doing the dishes and you dump out a pan and then you let it sit for a second, then all of a sudden now you can dump out more water out of it? That the water kind of collects oh, with yeah. itself? It's because of those strong hydrogen bonds that want, it's got very strong cohesive forces. It tends to draw together, okay? Just like it drew together right there that tracks itself, okay? Now, if I take, if I just take some base, here's some sodium hydroxide, one molar sodium hydroxide, okay? It dissolves as Na plus and OH minus, so I'm going to have some ions in here, okay? So now I put this into here. And while uh, the light comes on, because now we have ions present, so we've created an electrolytic solution. Okay, it's an electrolyte, so you have to have ions present. Now, if I take this, just to be consistent, and then I take some ammonia. Okay, that's been it. Take some ammonia, and I put just a little bit of ammonia into here. Now, ammonia makes ions. That's about the same amount as the base that I put in. Okay? If I put that into here... Oh, man. If I put that into here... If I put that into here... Okay, now you can see it's getting a little bit dimmer. Okay? No, you didn't see that it was dimmer? It was dimmer. Okay? All right. Can you tell now that it's barely coming on? Okay? So what does that mean about the number of ions now in the solution? There's very few. So now we have what's called a weak electrolyte. Okay? There's still ions present, just not very many. Okay? So the difference between a strong electrolyte and weak electrolyte is really not just a cutoff. It's just it varies. The more ions you have in solution, the stronger the electrolyte is. Okay. So things that dissolve as ions produce electrolytes. So you can have strong bases make strong electrolytes. Weak bases make weak electrolytes. Okay. That demo didn't really work so well now. Okay. Now, if I take something like ethanol. Ethyl alcohol, okay, ethanol, it doesn't conduct because what is it dissolving as? What ethanol? C2H5OH. What type of compound is it? C2H5OH. Covalent. Covalent compounds are composed of? No, that's what holds them together. Well, IMFs are what? What's IMF stand for? Intermolecular, Intermolecular forces. So, what are covalent compounds made up of? Molecules. molecules. Are molecules have a charge or are they neutral? Zero. Neutral. They're not ions, so they don't conduct electricity. Okay. So they're non-electrolytes, and we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. So, hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up, Mr. Hot! Hurry up! We have like 15, it's 25. 25. I let you out five minutes early last time and I went and checked. It's 25. It's 25. No, you can look at the schedule, it's 25. Yeah, we get out at 20 though. There's a bell that rings at 25. <laughs> Why don't you just let us have the okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did last week. Strong acids. This is still under electrolytes. And number one was strong bases. Number two are strong acids. Okay? Acids are covalent compounds that ionize in water. Okay, we have our six strong acids. We've memorized those to be. No, no, you're telling me. 
HClO4. Okay. HI. HBR. HCl. HNO3. H2SO4. Now, why not HF? Because HF is so small and has strong, strong hydrogen bonds, hold the molecules together that the hydrogen doesn't ionize to a great extent. It is a weak acid, not a strong acid. Okay? Now, that means that HCl, okay, HCl in water breaks up into H plus and Cl minus, 100%. One hundred percent. So you're going to have a bunch of ions present. Now again, we recognize an acid is an acid because the positive thing is hydrogen, right? So all of these are going to do the same thing. What's H2SO4 going to do? H2 is two two H2O four. Two H two O four. Two H plus is not H two because the H pluses are not going to bond together. Plus SO four two minus. We say that it is diprotic, meaning two protons, two hydrogens. Okay? So those are your strong acids. They're the only ones that break up 100%. Weak acids break up, but about 1% again or less. So they'd be called weak electrolytes, but most of them dissolve in the molecular form. So a weak acid dissolve mainly as molecules. but form a few ions. Just like weak bases. Now, we need to put quotes around molecules here. Do they really? Well, actually they do. Never mind. Because it's going to be, these are covalent compound bases are. The weak ones. Okay, so an example of this, our most common weak acid is HC2H3O2. Aqueous, we show a double arrow, meaning that it's a, it can go either way. Again, it's only about 1%. Only about 1% does that. So when, when we're writing an equation, and we want to say, well, what form is acetic acid mainly in? It's mainly in this molecular form. It's not mainly in the ionic form. So if we're writing in an equation, we're going to write it together, not apart. Strong acids, we write, they're mainly in the ionic form, so strong acids are going to be apart. Strong bases are going to be apart. Weak bases, weak acids, are going to be mainly together because they only ionize a small extent. So we want to, in the equation that we write, we want to represent what form are they mainly in? What's the most predominant form? AQ? O2? C2H3O2, the acetate ion that you memorized? Yeah. Regurgitated, then forgot. <laughs> okay? So, strong acids, exactly the same. So, again, if I take, if I take some HCl, if I take some, is this the alcohol? No, <laughs> I don't want to waste it. You left the word like that? You never ever pour back in the container because if this isn't the alcohol, I just ruined this whole bottle. Okay. But okay. I really don't okay. Okay. <laughs> no, but I feel good. <laughs> Actually, let me just tell you this, as far as the safety, because I'm kind of joking around with that. Um, alcohol that's in a science lab is called denatured alcohol, which means they've added poisons to it that cannot be separated from it. Okay, that way, Anthony, put it away. I'm going to take it next time. Okay? Now, denatured alcohol contains methanol and benzene. Methanol, 10 milliliters of it will make you go blind. A little bit more of that will kill you. Okay? Uh, it's got benzene in it, which is a carcinogen. Those things cannot be separated from it, so it doesn't have to follow the alcohol and the tobacco, the, the tax that's on alcohol. Uh, you know, you don't have to go through all the regulations with it. Okay? So don't ever think, oh man, we got the alcohol, let's, you know, let's go get some, because it will kill you, literally. Okay? I'm not just joking. I mean, it's just, 
it's just, I'm just always afraid that some high school kid's going to say, oh, you know, Mr. Hobbs got alcohol here, let's go get something good, you know, during lunch, let's go get, you know. I was gonna say I was gonna say I was gonna say lit, but that means something different now. And so, uh, you've got to be a special kind of student. Well, we have those special kind of students that are stupid enough to bring vodka in a water bottle to school. They have to, you know. Okay. I mean, seriously, if you have to bring alcohol to school with you, you got issues. Here we go. So here's here's my one molar HCL. There you go. Okay, strong electrolyte. So it's got ions. It's dissolving as ions. Listen, just y'all. Strong electrolyte. So now the third one, the most important that we got to finish with because it's going to lead us into our lab. <laughs> The third one are salts. Soluble salts. Which a salt is an old school name for ionic compounds. Okay? Ionic compounds. So, now they have to be soluble. Ladies. Soluble salts. Now, we have three big solubility rules that we just, these you'll have to know. You used to have to know that whole chart. We don't have to know that whole chart anymore. We need to know three rules for solubility. Okay? Number one, all alkali no compounds Are soluble. Okay? They're all soluble, meaning that there's no such thing as a sodium anything precipitate. Sodium, lithium, potassium, they, they, they're soluble, and no matter what the compound is, it's soluble in water. You put it in, it's going to disappear. Okay? All alkaline metals, the compounds. Number two, all nitrates are soluble. So if you look up here on this chart, okay, if you look up here on this chart, nitrates, the middle column are the ones that are soluble, and it says most cations, and then over on the right are the far, the far column are the things that form precipitates. No common cations form a precipitate with nitrates. There are no nitrate precipitates. Then when you come down and you look at sulfide, hydroxide, carbonate, phosphate, you're going to see the soluble compounds are only ammonium and then cations of column one, cations of column one, cations of column one. Because cations of column one are soluble with everything. So those form soluble, but those ones are forming precipitates with everything else. Third column are the precipitates. Middle column are the soluble ones. Notice that cations of column one are always in the soluble. Okay? And then, what do you think the other one is looking at that chart? What other thing is always soluble? So what? Ammonium. All NH4 plus are soluble. So you learn those three. If you know those three, you can predict what the other substance, what the precipitate is going to be. We used to have to know that your chloride, bromide, iodides, your halides, form precipitates with silver, mercury, and lead. Now, it's good to know. You needed to know that sulfates form precipitates with barium, lead, and strontium, that those were common precipitates. But now, they don't make you know that as much. You just have to know these three rules. But when we look at this, if we look at salt plus water, it's going to dissociate into Na plus Aqueous, I'll put the water over the arrow, into Na plus and Cl minus. The only way an ionic compound can dissolve is as ions, because that's what they're made up of. So ionic compounds, if they're soluble, they're strong electrolytes.
So there's only three types of things that dissolve as ions. Acids, bases, and salts. Being ionic compounds. But they've got to be soluble, and we know they're soluble if they're one of these three. Now, there are other soluble ones, but these are the big three. Okay? Now, just real super fast, non-electronics. It's much simpler. So all of that was, did I have a number on electrolyte? Do I have anything? Yeah. Is this a bullet? Okay. So non-electrolytes, I don't need to define it because if an electrolyte is a substance that conducts electricity, a non-electrolyte is, does not conduct electricity. They dissolve as neutral molecules. What's the only type of thing that's made up of molecules? Covalent. So it means it's going to be a covalent compound. Okay, now obviously it still has to be soluble in water. So oil is, an, is neither an electrolyte nor non-electrolyte because it's not soluble. Okay, so it's still talking about water solutions. Okay, so these are the substances that dissolve as neutral molecules. They're covalent compounds. Anything that's covalent, sugar, alcohol, any type of alcohol, ethylene glycol, you for antifreeze, anything that is just a covalent compound that's soluble in water, then it's going to be a non-electrolyte. Okay? And that's like I just showed you the alcohol. If I take some sugar, <laughs> uh, come on camera, over here. If I take some sugar, put it into water, Ooh, put a lot. Stir it up. Get something to dissolve. Don't have to all dissolve. Make sure it's still plugged in and is. Okay? Well, that wasn't just sugar. That was crazy. Can we name the camera? Sure, what do you want to name it? Cam Neutron. Cam Neutron. I must have used that AOH instead of water. It's the Kim Cam, Cam Neutron. Okay. There's the water. Take the sugar. Okay. So it's sugar dissolved in water. It's a covalent compound. Okay. It's dissolving. It's just breaking up into individual sugar molecules. It's so it's still disappearing. Okay. Breaking down the small, but it's made up of molecules, not ions. And so molecules are neutral. Molecules do not conduct electricity. It's a non-electrolyte. Okay? So, saying all of that, when we write equations, we need to be able to write equations, and double replacement reactions are the most common. We have to remember our solubility rules. So, the equation on the test was sodium carbonate plus silver nitrate. What did that make? Sodium nitrate plus silver carbonate. Okay? So now we want to say, okay, so which one of these is going to be the precipitate? Because in a double replacement reaction, we have to have something other than aqueous form. We have to either have a solid, liquid, or a gas form. Because otherwise, when we do our total net ionic equation, everything cancels out, and I'll show you that in a second. So which one of these, again, now do you think is the precipitate? And how would we know? Anthony. Okay, that is true. Now, how did you know that? Because all nitrates are soluble. So we know that sodium nitrate is soluble. What about Na? All alkaline metals are soluble. So this is kind of doubly soluble. So we know that this one's aqueous. So if a reaction occurs, this has to be a precipitate. Okay? So now, if I want to write this, though, in terms of what is it really like in the beaker? Here we go again. Let's get down small. Ooh, two minutes. Okay? This is going to dissolve as what? Na2 Na plus. 
two NA plus. Okay. Somebody else tell me why is it two NA plus? Because it's going to break apart. It's going to dissociate as ions. And the N is why is it not NA two? Because they're not going to bond together because they're ions. Two positive things do not come together. In nature, opposites attract. Plus CO3 two minus. Now, if it's aqueous here, it's got to be aqueous here because we're describing how it is in the water. It's just not going to be together. They're going to be individual ions, each one surrounded by water molecules. Okay, don't put the X's down. Okay, but each one's going to be surrounded. They're separated from one another. They're in the water. That's the whole point. So, what's this going to break up? Well, first, we've got to put a two and a two. What's this going to break up into? Okay. The two ions are what? Ag plus and NO3 minus. But if we have two Ag NO3, how many Ag pluses am I going to get? Two. two Ag pluses and two NO3 minuses. Okay, so if I have two Ag NO3s, I'm going to get two of each thing. Now, what's this? How's this going to dissolve? Because, again, this is what's going on in the beakers. This is what we're keeping track of on the lab that you have to turn in on Friday. So we're keeping track of what state dissolved, what precipitated out. So if it's ionic compound, it broke up into ions, they dissolved as the ions, it didn't precipitate out. Only the copper 2 hydroxide, because most hydroxides aren't soluble. So when we mixed it with the sodium hydroxide, the copper 2 hydroxide formed a precipitate, it settled out, but the other ions, they were all soluble. They stayed dissolved. They stayed broken apart. But this is the solid, so we keep it together. Now notice, notice that some of these ions didn't do anything. Notice the two NAs and the two NO3s, because they never bond with anything, they cancel out. What is the name of those that are the same on both sides? Spectator, Spectator ions. Okay, so our net ionic equation is CO3 2 minus plus 2 Ag plus goes to Ag2 CO3 solid. That's really, when you mix those two things together, that's really what happened. That was the chemical reaction minus all the fluff. That's what went down. Okay, now tomorrow in the lab, we're going to mix a whole bunch of things. You're going to have. Q Five unknowns, Q, R, S, X, and Y. And I'm going to kind of tell you what the five possibilities are, but you're going to have to mix them together based upon which ones form a precipitate and which ones don't. You're going to have to identify the compounds. Woo! Long day. You're lucky you can fast forward. Okay. Are you coming today? Stop. Stop.